I love the SSE meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes the themes turn out to be particularly interesting. Just about the time consilience was named as the theme for this meeting, I was working on something which turns out, I didn't know it at the time, but it turns out to be a, pretty much an exact match. And uh, I want to talk to you about that uh, today. I run this project called the Global Consciousness Project, and it's been on for about 20 years. It's a network of random number generators or random event generators spread around the world. The red spots here show where they have been. Some of them are still running. Some of them are, have retired. And um, my son uh, put the architecture together for software that still works after 20 years. He said, what you're doing looks a little bit like an EEG, but not for the brain, instead for the world. So he said, why don't you call it an electrogiogram? EGG. So uh, it was called the Egg Project for a while, and the devices are still called eggs. Uh, that may show up in a slide or two here. Anyway, a very brief introduction to what that um, does, and then we'll get to what I think of as the meat of my talk today. This is what the data look like. They're um, a trial every second, where a trial is 200 flips of the digital coin in true random number generators. And this, um, as I think you would probably all agree, doesn't look exactly interpretable. It, but the question we're going to ask is, is there structure in data like this? And in particular, is there structure when there's something going on in the world which brings people to a mass consciousness? First, I need to talk a little bit about how we process the data. This is now uh, all of however many of these devices there are uh, compounded into um, single points for each second as a, an average across all the devices for each second. That's not yet what we need. What we want is a variance measure. How much, do, how much ex, um, you know, difference from expectation is there in any direction, either direction? That's still not very interpretable. But there are small differences, quite often, between what's expected and what we actually have. And we, um, so I've amplified it here a little bit, but you still can't see much structure if there is any. So what we have done over the years is, most of the time, created a, what was, what's called a cumulative deviation uh, graph, just to show the history of deviations from expectation that happened. If the deviation is positive, this trace goes up. If it's negative, it goes down. So I'll show you a couple more pictures like that in uh, some examples. The protocol for the experiment has always been to identify an event. It might be a positive event, a big celebration, or it might be a tragedy of some kind. We specify the beginning of that event and the end of it, and, that, and th the corresponding data is what we look at and ask whether there's any structure. So this is an example. Um, two or th a few years ago, there, were, there was on September 21st, which is, has been for many years a day when people get together for peace marches. And climb, and, but this one combined, was combined also with attempts to make people think more clearly about climate change. And there were 500,000 people in New York and probably uh, similarly large numbers of people in most of the big cities. So millions of people were paying attention to that. Um, the bottom red trace is what an ex expected uh, sequence of data from this network should look like. Big difference. A couple more examples. This one is one that um, people who pay attention to the Global Consciousness Project often uh, recognized as the most uh, impressive of them all. And in some ways it is. We um, made a prediction and set our data, did our, the, all that stuff for a four hour plus period. 
Now, it turns out that there was a big change in the data. You can see it in the figure uh, that went on for about, an, or persisted for three days, more or less. We'll come back to that particular figure later. We have tragedies occurring all the time, and one of the hardest to understand is this mass murder um, tendency that we seem to have adopted. It's like a virus that spread. This is New Zealand, only two months, three months ago. But we also, as I said, look at both at negative and positive events. This one represents the Kumela, uh, which is a huge celebration of um, Hindu religion in India every few years. It doesn't happen every year. Millions, literally, uh, 10, 20, 30 million people, according to what I read, arrive in northern India and try to uh, bathe away their sins in the Ganges. This is a composite across four replications. They all look rather like each other and the buildup of um, evidence that something is going on in other words, that their structure and data that shouldn't have any is pretty strong. So going on to a kind of bottom line, this is what the data looked like um, when you just plot all the data, all the z-scores for each of 500 events as a scatter plot. Again, <laughs> it's not easy to make much sense of it, but you probably can see there's a, uh, a difference between two lines in the middle of that graph. But we use this cumulative deviation uh, tactic to make it a little more apparent uh, what's actually going on. Again, if the z-score is positive, we plot a step up. If it's negative, it, a step down. You can see that there are both negative and positive, but something like 70% of the events go in the direction that, of our prediction. And that builds up to an ex extraordinary um, p piece of evidence statistically, we have a seven sigma uh, departure from expectation, what people in the physical sciences think is good enough to say, oh, maybe, some, maybe there is some there there. So given a kind of solid foundation that something is going on, we can do a lot of different kinds of analysis. We've done a lot of digging in the data to see what kind of structure there might be beyond what we have predicted there would be. And there are several um, kinds of things that happen. There's a distance relationship. There, the kind of event matters. Uh, the size of the event matters. Quite a few things like that. But I want to talk about um, models. So because we have a lot of data, because it's a solid foundation, we can be, begin to test models against the data. So there are the two that stand out. One that I don't prefer is called goal orientation by some people or an experimenter effect. And I'm, my, most of what I'm going to talk about from now is why I don't prefer that, but instead think probably we're dealing with something that might be characterized just verbally in a hand-waving sense as a kind of information field or some kind of consciousness field, something that is constructed out of all of our individual consciousness somehow coming together to become, to produce a field with sufficient information in it of the kind that can be absorbed into random systems. That's, as I said, hand waving. We don't know how that would work exactly. But what we can do is find out if uh, the data are uh, consistent with the things that a, that a model like that would predict. Another version of um, this idea of a consciousness field, in, at least I think, is something John Muir said a long time ago. For those of you who might not recognize the name, he's one of the greatest naturalists uh, we've had. He says, when you try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. So I'm going to focus on this model, the goal orientation model, uh, which is the work of Peter Bensell, a friend and colleague who's been doing um, a lot of the deeper analysis in the global consciousness data. He tried for many years to show that a field model works 
very well, and he found lots of reasons to say that was the case. But at some point, at some level, he needed to be able to uh, get through the protective logical stages that prevent um, biases from affecting our, you know, things like temperature change or electromag electromagnetic fields. How do you get a, a mentally induced bias into a system that's protected so completely? He couldn't figure out how to do that. So he switched to an allegiance to a, this different model, an experimenter effect, which means you select the right time to start your experiment, you select the right time to end it, and thereby achieve um, the, uh, the production of um, a deviant sequence just of the sort you need. Um, he says that there's an implication. If you do that, I'll show you pictures that indicate better what, the, what we're talking about in a moment. He's, one of the implications, he says, is that uh, while during the event we'll have a positive trend in the data, before the event we'll have a negative trend. I think that actually is uh, essentially the gambler's fallacy, and I'm a little surprised, and I talked to him about it. How can you say that? Because these data, these sequential trials, are independent. There is no reason whatever to expect that taking a positive segment out should cause the adjacent segments to be negative. But this is what the figures look like that you produce if you combine all events across the, the uh, whole database of 500, or the short events only, or longer events only. These figures, Peter says, are consistent with the idea of this goal orientation, but not with a field-like model. So that's one interpretation, but um, as I mentioned, I was uh, thinking about this for quite a long time. And um, I, it troubled me that there were so many inconsistencies. For example, not all of these, in fact, not even half of the uh, short events that show so nicely this negative, positive, negative uh, trend that Peter is talking about, they're not all selected in the sense of somebody picking out the starting point because the starting point is used that was used before for the event like that eight years ago or five years ago. So this was rattling around in my unconscious or subconscious for a long time. And I finally had this sort of suddenly realization that this looked very much like something I had studied in graduate school. It looked like brain evoked potentials, only a little different because the kind of presentation using the the um, cumulative deviation trace, it shows the structure all right, but it doesn't show it in the same way that brain evoked potentials do. They typically show up, whether it's a light flash causing a little activity in your brain, um, or a, a sharp sound, or maybe a decision. Those, um, uh, in brain science, you can repeat the stimulus many times, get lots of samples of this, very noisy stuff. So, but when you put all the samples together, you can get a reasonably um, readable curve. So it, I decided, let's try that in the global consciousness data, which is noisy in the same way. But if we use smoothing, we can gradually get to something that looks a little bit familiar relative to that last slide. Here is the all events graph from Peter Bensell's work. And this is the same uh, data set. I converted the cumulative deviation back to raw data and did the smoothing, and that's the picture you get, which I think looks a little bit familiar. A couple more examples. This is the short events, the strongest case for, for this goal orientation model. And if you take that apart and plot the smooth raw data, again, you get this trace that looks a lot like a, an evoked potential to me. There's just a randomly chosen, arbitrarily chosen example. I also took all the events um, that I thought really ought to be good cases um, and put them together in the same way that Peter had the, uh, all of the short events. These are, this is all the six-hour events, and one thing you might 
immediately notice is that there isn't any negative trend before or after the moment when the, uh, the segment of data which is, corresponds to the events that actually showed some rather strong effect. The raw data from this, when trans transformed by the um, smoothing algorithms, again, looks rather like some sort of global uh, uh, brain uh, evoked response. One more example, 9-11 um, produced such a strong and clear trace. That's a nine-day period with 9-11 right in the middle. I decided to pull the raw data for that and uh, do the smoothing. And we see once again a, a close resemblance to the kind of things that we get from brain science. Here's a carefully selected version that happens to have almost exactly the same shape. But uh, this is interesting. This is um, contingent negative variation, which is uh, produced in a, in, and used to um, examine the possibility that something's going on that uh, amounts to brain response before the event that it nominally refers to. This is decision making. The brain starts producing some signals that sort of become the decision making signal before the person is conscious of the decision. So I think that uh, there is huge power in consilience and John Herschel, this is 1830, uh, said something that was very similar to something I've heard two or three times at this uh, meeting. He said, the surest and best characteristic of a well-founded and extensive induction is when verifications of it spring up, as it were, spontaneously into notice from quarters where they might least be expected. Evidence of this kind is irresistible and compels assent with a, a weight that scarcely any other produces. So I think that's consilience. Thank you. I should mention that if you're interested in more of the details, there are two books available, one in German. Uh, my co-author, Georg Kindle, and I produced this book last year, Der Weltgeist means the world spirit. And the subtitle says how we are all interconnected with each other. And the connected is, uh, was produced only in March. And that is the, yes, the subtitle of that is The Emergence of Global Consciousness. Thanks, Roger. Um, so, somewhat uh, a, a tangent of part of what you were showing. You talked about the mass shootings and uh, constantly reoccurring. Do you see, that, I mean, we've, there's news reports that we've become immune to all these mass shootings in the U.S. Do you see a reduction in this effect with mass shootings over, uh, over the years? I, I have not seen that uh, yet, but I did see that in terrorist attacks during the period of the Iraq War. At first, the, uh, when some, some um, terrorist attack uh, killed a couple hundred people, uh, the GCP would respond. Gradually, it became uh, kind of inured, I, I think, and responded maybe a little bit, but no longer so strongly. Um, it's an interesting idea. The only problem I see that you, you had events, and they're not all the same events. You know, I was thinking, what could we use? Because you wanted some same event that repeats all the time. Our president likes to tweet all the time. Why don't you use him as a, the sync signal for your averaging? <laughs> if, if the GC could tweet, it would say, no, thank you. <laughs> I came up here really with three comments. Roger beat me to one of them. I wanted to uh, put out a, a plug for Connected. Uh, the Connected was published by our ICRL Press, and it's gotten great reviews, and I was the editor for it, and I think it's a fantastic book. So do check it out, and it's got more information about Roger's program than you can imagine. <laughs> Second point was just a, 
uh, an addendum that I think the, the folks at, in SSE might appreciate was that one of the events that Roger recorded uh, that had a very strong effect was the time of Bob John's passing, which <laughs> was, I think, what was it, about three or four standard deviations? It was big. It, it, yes, three standard so, deviations. Uh, and this, uh, was, this is one of those kinds of things where there's no selection done. We know when Bob passed, so it's possible to take the data that, in the same way that we've done for other people, like Nelson Mandela. Same kind of uh, curve. It's, uh, it's kind of surprising. It's a global event in some way. I think so. <laughs> but my third observation is just to point out something that you are, of course, familiar with, uh, with regard to the evoke potential pattern. Uh, as you know, we saw a very similar pattern that we called series position effects in the pair data across all of the experiments that we did that uh, produced results. Same sort of initial strong effect that then dropped off and then gradually tapered or, you know, re recovered uh, close to baseline, although a little bit above. But that, that's just one other example of that. All right. Thank you. I, I really believe that, I mean, I didn't know what consilience meant when I saw the word. So, of course, I had to look it up. I bet m most of us did. <laughs> but um, I, I am now persuaded that we should pay attention when a, a word signals connection between things that otherwise would remain unconnected. Roger, I think what you're presenting is compelling, that this really is a global consciousness effect. But, it, but. There, but there is not a conflict between goal-oriented approach and a global consciousness approach, because you are programming the whole network with your mind to react to the global consciousness. And I, I discussed this in detail last year in my presentation on cybotics, and I believe you've created a large cybotic system <laughs> that actually is a global consciousness effect. But there are conflicts if you look at it as being purely mechanistic. Uh, so I leave it at that. Right. Yes, I uh, thank you. I, I agree, and I'm not alone by any means thinking, nor the, or the two of us, thinking that there is a kind of, I think Stefan Schwartz may have uh, come up with this particular term, but I like it, an intention contract that we make as experimenters between what we're interested in and the device, the system, the tools that we will use to try to learn something about that. Yeah. This is actually not a, a technical comment. I. Uh, was somewhat startled since, of course, I knew about Connected and I knew perfectly well it had been produced by ICRL Press. I'm, I'm wondering why the URL up there is bookdepository.com rather than icrl.org. I only had 20 minutes, so I thought, I can't say Amazon and Barnes and Noble also. But yes, it's much, uh, for people in this country, it's easily available at amazon.com or barnesandnoble.com. But for people in Europe, who want to order this book. It turns out Amazon does not ship, or will not ship. So you, th this pl uh, company um, ships for a price that includes shipping. It's, a, of course, a little more than the original. Thank you, Roger. Mm -hmm.